Uh, right. So where we uh, finished off on um, yesterday was we wrote down a definition of a topological phase, which was to some extent inspired by this model that we looked at, the Kataev uh, Torque Code model. And we tried to just pull out the most the, the features that we thought were universal in general from that model um, and put them together here. Now, this way of thinking about topological phases sort of uh, puts an emphasis on ground states. Okay? And uh, as we kind of discussed, there's a correspondence between ground states and topological phases. If I'm allowed to consider the ground states on surfaces of different topology, there's a correspondence between those and excited states above the ground state on, um, on let's say, the sphere okay? or, the, or the infinite plane. Uh, in particular, the example that we kind of focused on was ground states on the annulus, okay, which you could equally well think of as finite cylinder. Okay. Um, in fact, these correspond to precisely to the quasi-particles in the theory. quasi-particle excitations. Okay. Um, there was a, a comment that was brought up that there is some amount of arbitrariness in the way this is done, or there's a choice made, which I think is basically correct in the following way, which is when we say, well, look, we can think of these as the quasi-particle excitations, and one of those possible excitations is just the trivial excitation or no excitation whatsoever. The way to think of that is to say, well, let's suppose we had a state on the annulus and we imagine just filling in this hole. Okay. Well, we do have some choices in the Torah code of how to fill in that hole. Remember, we have plaquette terms with coefficients, um, let's say, j. I guess it was J2 is what I wrote down. So there's a co coefficient in front of the plaquette term. There's coefficients in front of the vertex terms as well. And in the Torah code, at least, you can have those with arbitrary magnitudes and even signs. And if we had put them in with the flipped sign, what we would call filling in here would have a different meaning than maybe the most natural meaning, which would have this with a plus sign. Okay? So that's kind of a side comment, but it's useful to keep in mind that the different possible ground states on the, on the annulus correspond to the different at quasi-particle excitations that you can have. Okay. So that's sort of keeping in line with this think way of thinking about excitations and topological phases as just ground states on surfaces with punctures. Now, when you think about it in that, those terms, you also notice that, so first of all, there's a, and this is kind of um, sort of what Nick started his lecture with today and ended uh, yesterday, is that there's a identity which we'll denote by one. One way of thinking about the identity is in terms of on the annulus, if we consider ground states on the annulus, or if we consider those pictures that we were writing down on the annulus, then the identity is in fact precisely the identity under this stacking procedure. So if I take my annulus and then put another annulus on the outside, the identity is precisely the thing that, that leaves it invariant. So it's the identity on, under the stacking operation. Okay. Um, in addition, every particle has an inverse that's unique. One way to think about that is we have some particle associated with the inner boundary here, but there's also a corresponding particle on the outer boundary, which is its inverse. So, yeah. So, um, what, what are the fields which the Kodak determines the exactly is in Oh, yeah, right. So, it, to give you an example, um, in the. It's a good question. So, um, so, let me be very concrete and consider the case of the Torah code. Then, what we would be drawing in here would be whatever, whatever arbitrary state here, okay? And out here, 
The outer annulus here is the thing that I drew before as the identity, which is I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? So this is the thing that I said is identity. So if I take this, and of course, by this, I mean a sum over all of the basis states with all the contractible loops put in here, together with this plus the corresponding sum. If I take this object with the natural notion of linear uh, combination, and I put that in the outside of this, in the outer annulus here, then it's the identity operation. It leaves whatever state was in here the same. Okay. And that kind of um, encodes the notion we have that the identity is sort of the trivial particle, or it's basically something that's equivalent to the ground, that is the ground state, so that if you add it to another particle, you don't change anything. So now we can move on from the annulus to the sphere with three punctures. Okay. This is kind of the primitive um, surface from which we can build up everything else. So we, let's consider the three punctured sphere with particle types A, B, and C bar on it. There's some finite dimensional set of, sta set of ground states, which in a real physical system, not in the Torah code, but, or at least not in the ex exactly soluble Torah code Hamiltonian, but in a, in a quote unquote more realistic model, these states will not be exactly degenerate for a finite size system. They'll have small splittings like this, but as you make this three punctured sphere large, those splittings go away and we'll have a set of degenerate states. Remember, that's what I was calling, you know, there n sub sigma of them. Let's call this vector space equals or quasi ground on three punctured sphere with particle types A, B, and C bar at the three punctures, okay? The reason, only reason I use quasi in, over here is because in a finite system size, they're not quite degenerate, okay? So there'll be some vector space of states, okay? That's the low energy Hilbert space of the system if you put it on a three punctured sphere with some boundary conditions on those punctures. The dimension of this space These are the numbers that Nick wrote down in the previous lecture. These are the n ABCs. Okay. So these integers, well, a good thing in general is if you find an integer, assume that it's a dimension of some vector space somewhere. Okay. So here's 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 the set of integers, and we understand it here as the dimension of this vector space. Take your Hamiltonian, put it on the three punctured sphere. Solve it some way or another on a computer by hook or by crook. Somehow you solve that Hamiltonian. You find on the three punctured sphere with specified boundary conditions of the punctures, you find that Hilbert space, its dimension is these NABCs. Okay. Any questions so far? It's just convention. This is the convention. Yeah, so I mean, the way you might think of, oh, okay, so that's a very good question. So the, the way, a way to think about it is to say that the word you would use, you would say A and B fuse to C, and then C and C bar. So if you join those two together, you might think of it as now being just two punctured if you merge two of the punctures, if you fuse two of the punctures. And so the, 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 two puncture, the two remaining punctures have to have equal and opposite 
topological charges. So that's why it's natural to think of it as A and B fused to C. Yes? I have a hard time understanding mm -hmm. Okay. And why I, I can kind of see why the formula in the next row down is a degeneracy when, mm -hmm. when, it's, mm -hmm. when n is 1, because then I'm just counting how many different files mm -hmm. can it be on the right yeah. hand side. But when it, n is bigger than 1, why, is that, why should I count that twice? Why should I count that okay, yeah. So, um, so uh, someone raised a point that this is analogous to combining um, irreducible representations, taking the products of t irreducible representations of Lie groups and then decomposing them as irreps. So with SU2, you can consider the same thing. Like with SU2, you can consider things like if you take the 1 half, you know, the spin a half times spin a half, you get 0 plus 1. OK? So it's a fact about SU2 that you will never get well, if you take the product of two representations, you'll get on the right-hand side only one copy of, N irre of any irre irreducible representation. But that's not true for SU3, for instance. You can get different copies appearing multiple times. You know, so if you just use the normal Young Tableau rules for SU3, you can find that you will get, you will, you will, you will sometimes, you know, with Young Tableaus, you know, there, there are these rules. You know how you how you how you multiply representations together. You can sometimes, in two different ways, the way you put these boxes together with SU three, you can get in two different ways the same representation appearing. Okay. And that and that means that there's an additional kind of internal number associated with you know with this. So actually. It's a very good time to, I mean, it's a good question because there's a graphical notation for this, OK, showing two, the fusion of particles types A and B to C. Now, if that can happen in more than one way, it's conventional to put an extra index over here, mu, to count the different ways in which that can happen. Okay. Um, but I guess I'm uh, okay. So as a process, yeah. I understand it. Okay. That's okay. What mm -hmm. But I, what I don't understand is what is that? The question of degeneracy seems to be slightly different. <coughs> if how many different wave functions can you write down with a single sequence or a function? And that that's kind of a pro seems like that process is kind of how many different types of wave. Well, it's the same thing as the, uh, how many different processes allow you to get rid of the quasi particles. Um, oh, oh, I mean, I'm not sure I fully understand your question, but I, I think you're right. There, there is a difference, which is, um, you know, I think Nick was showing. So if you take more than three particles, you know, if you if you draw, let's say something with four particles like this, then even if you fix, you know. Point, point. Ah, yeah. There's a light right there. Oh. There's a little switch. Light it up. Beautiful. OK. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, so there is indeed a degeneracy coming about from the fact that this, if you specify the particle types, this is not fully specified. So, you know, there are different, po so there's, a de there's some degeneracy coming about from the fact that for fixed A and B, there are different, po I should probably call it C to, to make this more clear. For fixed A and B, there are different possible values of C if you're inside of some larger state where you have other particles. So that's kind of degeneracy coming from the fact that this C can vary. But in many cases, actually not the ones I'll be focusing on in my lectures, but there are cases in which there's an additional degeneracy on top of it coming from, even if you fix C, there are different possible mu values. I think that, that's the difference that you're saying, right? It's the kind of, yeah, right. So I agree. That's correct. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, so here, in fact, even in cases that are non-abelian, okay, which have interesting degeneracy, it can be the case that for fixed A, B, and C, these are only zeros or ones. That's right, yeah. Good. Uh, I think, was there another question? Yeah. The big cats you draw are equal to 
Isotopy. Isotopy. Yeah. Isotopy. Yeah. 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 Iso no. Okay. The way, I mean, you're right. They. Yeah, I know the blue lines can cross, but that they really can cross because it doesn't matter exactly how we how we. Um, yeah. Okay. So for this particular case, you're right. I mean, they they are they are allowed to they are allowed to cross. Yeah. I mean, what you say is definitely technically correct. I think it probably is conceptually a little easier to think of them as isotopy invariants, together with the fact that you can uh, get rid of any contractible loop which is not part of isotopy ordinarily, but you can shrink down a contractible loop and erase it. And you can perform these surgeries. You know, these, the things that I was mentioning before, you know, that this is equal to this and a contractible loop is equal to an empty picture. That's not part of isotopy ordinarily. And these are, I, I would prefer to think of these as two extra conditions on top of isotopy rather than to merge it all into calling it homotopy. It is. Yeah, absolutely. It is. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just saying that conceptually, because when you generalize, it's actually these are the things that you generalize as you go to other models that are, you know, not the toric code. Yeah. The isotopy part doesn't change. Yeah. Um, good. OK, so. So with So with these vector spaces on three punctured spheres we can build up the Hilbert spaces on more complicated surfaces so another way of drawing the three punctured sphere is often called a pair of pants. Okay, here's the three punctured sphere again. You can take these and you can glue them together to form So you can glue them. Uh, so you can glue these things together. Okay. So I could take, for instance, so if I take this looks like A B. Okay, so if I if I take if I take one of these three punctured spheres with its vector associated vector space, and I tensor it with the vector space for this other three punctured sphere, and take a direct sum over all the particle types C that can appear here, I can thereby glue together two three punctured spheres to form four punctured sphere. This corresponds to a picture that Nick drew in the previous, or an example, or one of the pictures that Nick drew in the previous lecture, where here we've got A, B, C, D, and E. You're fusing together A and B to form C. That fuses with D to form E, is one way of thinking about it. Okay. Where these Cs are allowed to run over all the particle types in which can appear here. The, I think it's E bar, right? I don't think so. Oh, yeah, I, I have this backwards, though. Yeah, I have this backwards. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So these rules, okay, as Nick said in the previous lecture, these things are called fusion rules. And are often written as A times B. OK. 
Okay? So the, the non-zero values of the n's tell you what possible fusion pro outcomes you can have. If you take two particles, A and B, you bring them close together, these are the possible particles C that they end up looking like. In this way of thinking about it, it's if you have three punctures and you fix two of them, A and B, the particle types associated with them, it tells you what possible Cs you can have for which it's a, no, it's a Hilbert space that's of non-zero dimension. These are the three punctures. Yeah, I just widened out the three punctures a little bit and deformed it. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, I guess I'm wondering. Uh -huh. So these fusion rules, do they describe suppose you can think mm -hmm. of a physical process of fusing particles yeah. together? Should I think of it then I get okay, I fuse A and B. Do I get whatever's on the right hand side is I get a linear combination of on a superposition? Good. Of yeah. Things? You should think of it as as vector spaces. Okay, so for particle types A and B and C, you have some vector space. And if you fuse together A and B, you have a, a way of combining those vector spaces. So really, you have some state. So the system is, de is, de the system is described. So in this case over here, I don't, can you see this, this board? So the system over here is described for fixed A, B, D, and E. The system is described by some vector in the Hilbert space. And a basis, a particular basis for that Hilbert space is the diff given by the different possible values of C over here. Well, up to the fact that, OK, it's a little more than that because there are these indices that can appear at the vertices. But let's, so, uh, uh, yeah, so, so since you asked about it, I just, I'm, I'm putting those down. But I'm going to drop them from, from now on just to keep things uncluttered. But, if anyone wants to remember, there really are is an additional additional degeneracy coming from those. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yep. You you will get some particular superposition that depends on what happened in the past history of A and B. No, with coefficients, it depends on what, hap what will happen in the past history of A and B. OK. No, the coefficients, these are, these are just integers. These are integers that tell you the dimension of the possible Hilbert space. OK. The actual state of the system is some vector in that Hilbert space whose coefficients depend on what happened in the past history, where A and B came from, for instance. If A and B were particle antiparticle that you had popped out of the vacuum, and you did nothing else, and then you tried to fuse them back, you have to get back to vacuum. Okay. But on the other hand, if, they bre if something else happened, then... Okay, no. then, it's, then that, that, like exactly. That, yeah. that depends on the past history, which is what I'm going to go to right now. Okay. Yes? Yes. I am taking two three punctured spheres and gluing them together. Uh, it, no, it is the first one. I'm trying to, uh, what I'm trying to, um, I mean, they're related, but what I'm trying to illustrate here is that just starting with three punctured spheres, you can build up things like four punctured, five punctured, six punctured spheres. Or for that matter, you can go back and you can get to the torus by taking a, th a three punctured sphere and gluing two of the punctures together to f and, and just setting one of the punctures to the identity. So it's really, the, the, of the two things that you said, I think it's better to think of it the first way. As th think of the three punctured sphere as kind of the primitive element here from which we're building up more complicated surfaces. Yep. Right. Yeah. According to, the, according to this, yeah. Now you have a torus with punctures, yeah. Okay. 
So now, if we, if we generalize this, okay, we consider the n-punctured sphere now. Okay, so here's the n-punctured sphere. Now, if you imagine, okay, all the possible deformations that you can have of the n-punctured sphere, okay, in other words, all the diffeomorphisms or all the coordinate transformations that you can put on the n-punctured sphere, well, of course, there are lots of them that are kind of trivial in the sense that they're just small deformations. So if we just mod out by all of the small deformations, meaning all the ones that are continuously connected to the identity, then we get what's called the mapping class group. Okay. So now what we have is all the things that are not, you should not just think of as small deformations of this, but kind of large motions okay. that still bring it back that still preserve its topological class. Now, these turn out to basically be essentially equal to, and I'll say what the diff why it's not quite equal to, but it's essentially equal to the Bray group on n minus 1 particles. The reason it's n minus 1 rather than n is you should really think of one of these as being the point at infinity that allows you to open up into the plane, and then you have n particles in the plane. Okay. And this group, so this has the presentation that Nick, did, did you use sigmas or taus for the Bray group? Taus. Okay, so this has the presentation that Nick wrote down earlier, which is they commute if i minus j is greater than 1. And so these are counterclockwise exchanges of the punctures, or equivalently of the particles. This relation here. <coughs> is often called the Yang-Baxter equation. The states of these two are equal to each other. So we can ask about, so a major part of understanding these states is to understand the action of the mapping class group, or really the Bray group, on this Hilbert space, which here is the Hilbert space for the n-punctured sphere. Okay. So yes? Yeah, so this isn't the complete story. This is a, kind of the important part. Yeah, so I will come back to that momentarily. Yeah. Are there any other questions? No, I, and in fact, I'm not going to, I'm not going to prove this or try to explain it to you. Take it for now as just a given that it's it's basically the Bray, the Bray group. It's intuitively quite reasonable that 
you know, the motions of these punctures that bring them around other punctures and bring them back are deformations that keep the system invariant that are not um, deformable to the identity because it would have to move through this other puncture. Okay. I mean, I'll say now the other piece that's missing from this is that there's also Dane twists, which is to say that you can, which we talked about a little bit in the context of the annulus, which is you can cut out one of these punctures, do rotation by 2 pi, and glue it back in. Okay. Um, well, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll explain a little bit, yeah. Two pi twist, yeah. It's a two pi twist of the puncture, relative to everything else held fixed. Okay. Okay, good. So, um, so now one important um, characteristic of, of of these punctures, or equivalently of particles, is that if you have two of these particles or punctures, their topological, their total charge can't change. Well, first of all, it can be observed entirely by what's happening out here. After all, we could put this on a three-punctured sphere. In fact, maybe it's useful to draw it that way. OK, so anything that I do over here that doesn't introduce any additional punctures can't change the total topological charge of A and B, which has to be C if this vector space is non-zero non dimension. So what that means is, if I think about what happens, the action of a braid where I take B around A, it can't change this, right? So in particular, all it can do, and we draw it this way, If A and B, on the three-punctured sphere, if A and B fuse to C, as shown here, if I do an exchange, and here I'm only showing a half of a braid, all it can do is it multiply the state of the system by a phase. So again, I'm considering here the simple, the simple case where there's no additional indices on the vertex. This is, at most, a one-dimensional Hilbert space, right? So dimension, or NABC equals 0 or 1. So if it's a, a zero-dimensional Hilbert space, of course, there's nothing to think about. If it's one-dimensional, you take B around A, what could possibly happen? You could pick up a phase. Okay. That phase, for reasons that maybe become a little bit clear later, we instead of writing down that phase, we really write down its square root, which is the phase associated with half of a braid. That's denoted by RABC, and often called R matrix, although in the cases that we're talking about here, it's actually just a phase, R. Okay. So there is some ambiguity in this. There's some gauge freedom, because obviously, if A and B are different, there's a plus or minus sign ambiguity in this. If A and B are actually the same, if they're identical particle types, then, of course, we're allowed to do not just this, but we're allowed to do an exchange of A and B. And this itself is well defined. Okay. However, yeah, I'll come to your question in just a second. However, even in that case, it has to be said there is some gauge ambiguity or phase degree of freedom in all this structure. Because after all, if we talk about, in, well, quantum mechanics allows you to redefine a basis state in one of these Hilbert spaces by a phase. And you have to make some arbitrary choice of what those phases are. Yes? It can depend on the extra mu label, which is why sometimes it's called the R matrix. OK, so, so the last few minutes have been a bit abstract since we haven't, we sort of left behind a little bit the, 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 the torrent code. And we haven't been talking about a model and talking slightly abstract. Is there a light on this one, too? 
So let's go back and talk about concrete models again. So the Torah code, if you recall, we found that there were four particle types, 1, E, M, and Psi. Okay? There are fusion rules associated with this, which remember are basically just the dimensions of the three punctured sphere Hilbert spaces. The fusion rules here are And then um, okay, and the others I think are straightforward. One times anything is one. Okay. So these are the fusion rules in the Torah code. So these are so that tells you that there's certain numbers, some of these n's are equal to one. So this is n e e one equals one, n m m. 1 equals 1, and so on. And there's a bunch of others that are, that are 0 if something doesn't appear on the right-hand side of this equation. So for instance, n, e, e, m equals 0. Okay. So if you look at this equation here, this is telling you the fact that if you multiply e by e, 1 can appear on the right-hand side, but it can only appear in one, way, one time. Okay. That's part of the definition of the identity. The identity can only appear uniquely on the right-hand side of this equation. On the other hand, if you multiply e by e, you can't get m on the right hand. You cannot get m on the right-hand side, which is why this is zero here. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Good. Okay. So here's an example from the model that we, that, we, that we studied yesterday. This is an example of what the fusion rules look like. Are there any questions? All ends are 1 or 0 for this model. Correct. That's right. And moreover, for fixed A and B, there's only one non-zero C. OK. Which. From, from the previous lecture, from Nick's lecture, that's, that's one way of seeing what, I mean, which may have already been obvious to you, that's one way of seeing why they're all abelian particles in this model. If you fix the particle types here, there is only one possible particle type for which it's non-zero over here. Yeah. So that makes it abelian? Abelian, correct. We'll momentarily, well, not momentarily, soon, we'll consider an example where that's not true. But let's do this example first. It is. Is this like mm. the fact that squaring a particle gives you identity? Is that something to do with the C2 nature? Yes. And as Nick said, it's the group Z2 cross Z2, so. Yeah, so in this particular case, you'll notice that the right hand sides don't have, in principle, if you remember, the right hand sides of these equations could have had <coughs> could have had a sum of terms. Okay, so it would be a fusion algebra. But in this particular case, the right hand sides only have at most one term. Okay, so so it actually has a group structure. This is just a group multiplication law for the group Z2 times Z2. Yes. I have the freedom of thinking. Oh, oh yes, sir. And, uh, and that's the case for all, uh, all abelian enneons. Theories that have only abelian enneons, the fusion algebra is actually just the group. It's just a finite group. Yes. Abelian. Finite abelian group. Yep. Like yes. Think of these as either excitations of a unique ground state in the plane or as a set of quasi degenerate ground states on the punctured, on the punctured sphere. Well, here, I'm just considering the three punctured sphere. Three. three. Where the punctures are the number of punctures is the number of the non No, the, the number of punctures is three for the fusion rules. The fusion rules are defined in terms of the three punctured sphere. 
where the three punctures are the three particle types appearing here. Well, one can appear also, like E times E equals one. This is a three punctured sphere with E, E, and one on the three punctures. Non abelian means that for two of them fixed, there are several different possible val charges that can appear in the third puncture. The fact that there are three mm. non trivial particle types is a coincidence. It's a total coincidence, yeah. Okay. Thank you, yeah. But that's a total coincidence in this case. Yeah. No. Okay. So th these are the um, fusion rules for the um, the torque code. Now, I'm assuming that you all did the homework last night uh, that I assigned. So therefore, you'll know what happens when you take particles around each other in the torque code. So R E E one is one, you take an electric particle around an electric particle, nothing happens. No phase is acquired. R okay. Now, on the other hand, when you got to the side particles, presumably you found that a minus one is acquired when you do an exchange. Okay, it's identical particles. The, do the notation psi kind of implies that it's a fermion. And if you actually worked with those pictures and exchanged two of the particles, applied all the surgery and so on, and kept track of the minus signs that are inherent to the definition of these particles, you would find that you get a minus sign over here. Okay. Now, there's another non-trivial one, which is R, E, M, Psi. Now, these are distinguishable particles. So really, the only physical thing is taking an E around an M, and then taking the M around the E. So this is really the physically measurable quantity is REM psi times RME psi. And again, as you saw in your homework last night, this is equal to minus 1, this product. Now we can take that minus 1, and there's essentially a gauge choice here in how we decide to break up that minus 1 between these two factors over here. It's conventional. I'm not sure exactly why, where this convention came from, but it is conventional for this one to be minus 1 and this one to be plus 1. Okay, But this is a matter of convention. The thing that's physically measurable in principle is just that product. Take an E particle around an M particle, you're supposed to get a minus 1. What happens at the halfway point is somewhat a matter of choice, as long as these two multiply together to get what you expect. Yes. Correct. Yeah, there's no such thing as R, E, M, and 1. Exactly. Because E and M can never give you 1 here. That's right. Jeff, what, what's the advantage of talking about that? Uh, yeah, well, it, 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 ha it has some advantage, which we'll come to in a little bit. Where, um, when we try to figure out the consistency conditions that all these things satisfy, it's useful to, to, to make use of the, the additional, I mean, effectively, it's a gauge freedom. It's a, useful to make use of that gauge freedom that's inherent in that. That will come out. But also, it does let you treat all particles sort of democratically, because, because for identical particles, it really is an important thing. So it allows you to define one symbol, which is RABC, which you can use always, including now it has more meaning when it, you know, um, 
So our ABC obviously has a more physical meaning when these two particles are the same, but it lets you use one symbol to discuss the whole thing. Yeah. And then, as we'll see, it is actually pretty convenient when you try to use, find the consistency conditions that these things have to satisfy. Yes? So in terms of mm -hmm. space on the three functions here, yes. I interpret this picture uh, on the bottom board uh -huh. as, like you have a particular three functions sphere. Yeah. Right. Yes. There's a phase factor. You know it's a one-dimensional vector space. All that can happen is a phase factor, and this is the phase factor associated with it. Yes. OK. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Not really. I mean, you would just, it, 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 re it really only makes sense when C appears in the fusion product of A and B. Yeah, they don't really exist. Yeah. I don't think so. No. That that's why it's a mate. That's why that's why, that's the reason why this. Even though it's it's normally in, well normally oh, no, then, it's then it's a matrix. Then it's a matrix. Yeah. No. No. OK, so let's consider an example then, OK? Oh, um, yeah, so one, well, let me just briefly say one other thing, which is um, which is, uh, as promised, that, you know, rating these things isn't the full story. There are also Dane twists, which is you take one of the punctures and rotate it by 2 pi. You can graphically denote that by this. Take a particle, do a 2 pi twist to it. This, in, um, in a slightly confusing notation, so if this is a particle type A, this phase is called, again, this is just, all you can have at most is a phase, because uh, uh, you're just doing a twist of a particle. That phase is often called theta a, which you might think theta would be an angle, but theta is actually the phase. So, you know, theta a is equal to the e to the i something or other. So I know it's, first of all, I apologize, but it's totally standard notation, so we'll have to use it. But this phase factor is, is often called the, usually called the twist. Twist factor theta a. And just be aware that even though people use the notation theta, it's actually e to the i something. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I wish. Yeah. <laughs> so for the for the for the Tor code, um, the thetas are theta one equals theta e equals theta m is plus one, and theta psi equals minus one. Okay. Actually, yeah. OK, so, so I, what I've tried to do up until now is introduce two different ways of thinking about the Tor code model. One is, you know, we have some Hamiltonian. OK. Maybe you can put it on the Tor, on, on sigma, or look at excited states. OK. So that's one way to think about this. There's an alternate way, which is what we've just been talking about, which is to think in terms of a more algebraic picture where we have some particle types A. They have some twists, theta, some fusion rules, N, A, B, C. R matrices, R, A, B, C. There's, there's a little more data, which we'll, we'll introduce shortly. Okay. 
But it's basically some set of algebraic data associated with this phase. Okay. And as Nick kind of mentioned at the end of his lecture, the usual word that goes with this is modular tensor category. But let's just call it some algebraic structure. Okay. Now, um, there's a, a third way that we can think about these, okay, which is in terms of effective field theories. or, in particular, TQFTs, topological field theories. And each of these ways, well, there's a fourth way, which I'll say a few words about also, which is, which is the actual real world, OK? Um, which Nick alluded to in his talk when he discussed the quantum Hall effect. So I should probably put that somewhere in this. Well. <laughs> Yeah, the Hamiltonian is a mo the Hamiltonian is a simplified model of the real world, actually, and I think that's that is actually uh, an important distinction that I want to say some things about. But it's a more microscopic description. Yeah, so th th this is maybe potentially a stronger bond between these two. In principle, this is the connected graph. What? Hopefully, yes. And uh, yeah, so this in in yeah, th this in the ideal case involves experiments. And if we're really lucky, it has something to do with the rest of this. Okay. <laughs> okay. But uh, but before I actually, I, I do want to get to that. But before I get to that, I want to say a few words about this. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a really good question. So. <clears throat> yeah. So the question is basically: these Dane twists are they really independent from R? And well, maybe another way of saying the question, or rephrasing the question as well, isn't there a spin statistics theorem that sort of tells us how these things are related? And um, the usual picture that's drawn is, let's imagine we create particles out of the vacuum. So, th so this would be a case where this is fusing to the identity, let's say. And we do an exchange of two particles like this. Okay. Well, this picture can be deformed into a picture that looks like this. So this looks like we put a twist. We created only. It looks like we created only a single pair of particles, particle antiparticle pair. Put a twist in one and annihilated. This is you've created two pairs and done an exchange. This picture can be obtained from this one, and it relates the thetas to Rs. Okay. Another thing that you can observe is if you take this and you twist this whole picture around, holding all of these fixed, this ends up looking like. These pictures are a little bit easier to draw. Um, to, to save time, I'm not doing it that way. These pictures are easier to draw if you fatten out these lines into, into ribbons. And if you draw them as ribbons, you can see that as you move things, they end up getting twisted up. So what it does tell you is that the twists and the R's are related to each other, okay? as you might expect through spin statistics. I haven't yet. I'm getting there. I, I want to actually introduce a model where they're not just all one. So I, in this particular model, they're all one, so it's kind of boring. But I'm going to get to Ising Enions relatively soon. It's, ba it's basically fixed by R for, for, the, for it, it is fixed by R for those particle types who, which are, are equal to their own antiparticles. It's exactly fixed by R in those cases. In the other cases, they're strongly tied together. 
by relations like this. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, say that again? Spin statistics. It, there, there, there is a spin statistics theorem. It just, it just, it, it, it doesn't uniquely fix the thetas if, if, if a is not equal to a bar. But it puts constraints on these things. Okay, so. Um, yeah, effective field theory. So the basic building block for understanding abelian phases is abelian Chern Simons theory. So this is abelian Chern Simons theory. This is uh, I also want to add A is the basic dynamical field in this theory. And J here, we're going to take to be the sources Or in other words, basically fixed quasi-particles in the theory, or equivalently, punctures. So here I've explicitly put in some sources J. We didn't have to do this. We could instead just work on, let's say, the punctured sphere and just have some punctures with boundary conditions. It's just a little bit more transparent in this case to write down some sources J. Now. The basic feature physics of this theory is more or less um, manifested by the equation of motion of the field A0. Its equation of motion is we vary the action with respect to A0, we get m over 2 pi. which is saying that the curl of the spatial component of A is equal to the density, J0 is a density, density of these sources, up to this factor of 2 pi over m. Okay. As a re result, by the Aronoff-Bohm effect, okay, by the Aronoff-Bohm effect, if we have two sources or two particles that carry charge under this gauge field or two sources and we drag one around the other okay so let's say each of these has charge one then what happens is you pick up an Aronoff bohm phase 2 pi over m So this theory really, it's, 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 all, its sole purpose in life okay, is to attach some flux to charges. And the, as a result of the flux that's attached to charges, when you take another charge around, you pick up a phase. Okay. Correct. Exactly. Yes. What's that? This phase is, uh, 
is this this is a topological phase it's not a geometric phase so it it does not depend on the path except insofar as it counts the number of these particles that are enclosed within the path okay now we can build up abelian theories by taking copies of this so in particular for the toric code So right now, all I've, all I've explained is how this theory reproduces the phase that you get when you take one particle around another. The theory actually does other things also. If we put it on the torus, it will get ground state degeneracy on the torus. If we put it on a disk, it'll tell us something interesting about what happens at the edge. I'm going to come to those other properties in, in my next lecture. For now, I just want to make this correspondence with the, with the braiding properties. So in particular, if you, uh, did I erase it? No, here. So if you, no, I guess I did erase it. So uh, let me just rewrite it. So if you'll recall, we had things like this. and so on, right? These are encapsulating the braiding properties in the Torah code that if you take an E particle around an M particle, you're, um, you're supposed to get minus one. If you, take a, if you exchange two sides, you're supposed to get a minus one and so on. Uh, those can be captured by a theory of this form if we just take two copies of this theory. The normal way to write this so I've introduced an extra index the mu nu lambda these are space-time indices so these are all mu, nu, lambda, are all running 0, 1, and 2. OK, 0 is time. 1 and 2 are the two spatial directions. But then I've introduced an extra flavor type of index, which I've denoted with capital I's and J's. And in this particular case of the Torah code, I and J run just from 1 to 2. Okay, The 1 and 2 correspond essentially to electric and magnetic charges. And the matrix K for the Torah code is just the matrix, which is 0 on the diagonals and 2 is off diagonal. Now, why do I say this is the low energy effective theory of the Torah code, well, if we look at the thing that course, the, the generalization of this constraint, what it tells us is that Because this matrix is off diagonal, when we derive the equation of motion following from varying A0, what you find is that the curl of A1 is set equal to the density of two particles up to a factor of pi and vice versa, which means that the type 1 particles, let's call 
one is like the E particles, and two is like the M particles. The E particles, so in, in, in particular, if we call what we call J2, this is the density of M particles. J1 is the density of E particles. And what this equa these equations are saying is that E particles see pi flux sitting on every M particle. M particles see pi flux sitting on every E particle. As a result, you take an E around M or vice versa, you get the minus signs that we discussed. Yes? These are classical or semi-classical equations of motion, but um, in fact, they're constraint equations because A0, the time derivative of A0 never appears in this action. So they're actually constraint equations. Does it, mean yeah. it? it means that it also holds, at the, in, fa in fact, for the abelian theory, it, very, it straightforwardly holds at the quantum level. Yeah. Yes? No. I mean, I think for every abelian phase there is. I don't think we're sure that that's true in general. <laughs> yeah, so in particular, I'll say, I, I, I haven't f said the rest of what appears in this. But in principle, there could be consistent algebraic structures for which the field theory isn't known. Okay. In this particular theory, not much. I mean, there are quantum phases. The aronoff bohm effect is a, is a quantum phase. But this gauge field, I, I haven't put in this any um, dynamics of these things. If these were allowed to be dynamical, then you would see quantum fluctuations corresponding to the fluctuations, the positions of these objects. But this is very semi-classical at this stage. OK. So oh, yes, yeah, so I want to say a few words about this, which is how all this relates to the real world. So, the, so that, that's effective field theory, low energy effective field theory for the Tor code. It has the right phases and so on. We also have some algebraic structure. We have a Hamiltonian. Now, OK, so in the real world, in principle, one could make this Hamiltonian. OK, so let me rewrite it just for. <coughs> Sake of completeness. In principle, in the real world, one could try to Okay. So in principle, one could try to make this. However, okay, if you have real spins in the real world. Well, the spins in principle have some dipolar interactions that are not really short ranged, okay, because there's magnetic fields. So you're not going to get exactly this. You won't quite have a short ranged Hamiltonian. For some things, that distinction doesn't particularly matter. Um, another way in which one might try to see very similar but not identical physics in the real world is if we consider. So the structure underlying the Tor code is also present, at least in part. Let's imagine we had a two-dimensional superfluid or superconductor, okay. paired superfluid or superconductor. Well, if you think about what a vortex and a BDG quasiparticle so in a superconductor or paired superfluid, we have unpaired electrons. Okay? We also have vortices in such a thing. Well, these BDG quasiparticles look a lot like our size. They're fermionic. And when they go around an M particle, they pick up a minus sign. So some features of the toric code are present in a 2D superconductor. However, some features, important features are not. 
So if you recall, the definition of a topological phase requires that it has a gap. A two-dimensional superconductor or superfluid does not have a gap. The reason being, for a superfluid, it has Goldstone modes corresponding to phase fluctuations. The 2D superconductor doesn't have a gap in the norm normally does not have a gap because the electromagnetic field, which would gap out the Goldstone modes by the Anderson-Higgs mechanism, well, the electric field lines move out of the plane and into the third dimension, as a result of which, this is not actually a fully gapped system. There are gapless excitations in a charged two-dimensional superconductor. It goes from the Goldstone bosons are no longer omega goes as Q, as they would be in a superfluid but instead it's omega goes as square root of q. So it's not quite gapless. As a result, if we were to put such a thing onto a torus, we would find the different ground states that we were discussing in the context of the torus, which actually correspond to different fluxes through the holes in the torus, are not really degenerate, not exponentially degenerate. Okay. So the most simple, sort of the most, I would say, the most appealing and simple version, physical version of the toric code, which is just a two-dimensional superconductor, doesn't quite work. It has some, but not all, features. We could imagine making the whole world two-dimensional, so that even the electric field lines were lying entirely within the 2D plane. In that case, the toric code really would be, if we lived in a two-dimensional world, then it really would be just the same as a superconductor. Okay. So that's something to just keep in mind as we go to some other examples that it's a beautiful you know, definition, but um, I think most systems, if you really look at the totality of the system, don't quite have local Hamiltonians with gaps. There's always something gapless around, maybe phonons, maybe things that we would ordinarily think are kind of innocuous, but we should always be a little careful about whether they're not fully innocuous. Yes. Well, yeah, no, no, sorry. Yeah, so I, I, was, I was using, sorry, this was uh, a little bit of artistic license. So I was saying, let's imagine we have a vortex line here, an HC over 2E vortex. Then as far as the two-dimensional world is concerned, it really is just that point right there. Correct. I mean, again, if we were living in a fully two-dimensional world, there really is no extra, you know, the, well, first of all, outside of this, these lines spread, so there's not really like a vortex. But if you were in a truly two-dimensional world, then, then, of course, there is no third dimension to look at here. Uh, yes. Well, I'm going to say more about superconductors. And I think Nick is also going to say more about superconductors. So this is the S-wave superconductor case. So if you look at, and I think Charlie maybe also will say so a few more words about what are generally called topological superconductors. So in those cases, although the statements I said are still true, there's just richer structure there. So there's just more structure that's preserved in the translation from kind of pristine topological phase to the real world. Uh, yeah. So I was going to make a comment that just partly addresses that question. And, and it, this is something we'll hear more about in the third week, probably, but I just wanted to say that there are um, simple but definitely not solvable, fairly elicited signals that the first week is pretty good. Essentially, the same structure as the fourth book. Okay. Um, but not, you know, they don't, I, I don't think they, they're not there. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. <coughs> well, okay. So I think Mike just said that there are more realistic models, and maybe there will be experimental attempts based on those. I think. What's that? But, but, oh, sorry. The oh, um, you know, 
I mean, yes, um, not in exactly this way. Um, I mean, there's something called surface codes, which basically applies the terms in the, it's a little bit of a, yeah. The short answer is people are trying to engineer things like this, but not by having terms in the Hamiltonian, but rather by dynamically looking for basically places where this um, is violated and then fixing it. So to sort of enforce this, you know, dynamically. This is what's called surface codes, which people are, are quite popular now in quantum computing um, to try to kind of dynamically do this rather than have it as a term in the Hamiltonian. Um, and that's, I think, mostly transmon qubits is where that's kind of being envisioned. Um, it's a little more complicated than, than just this, but, but I'd say that is very close to a literal, you know, uh, realization of the torque code where they're trying to li realize literally that. Okay. So we're no. thinking of principle with material outside to modify the three Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's true. Actually, so I think I got a copy of a preprint from you guys. A preprint from people here who have an idea about that, I just haven't had a chance to read it yet. But 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 um you say no Well I the, the, the answer is I mean if you could confine the lines to make this look truly two dimensional, then then I think you're in good shape. Yeah. I don't know of any experimental efforts. That's correct. And that means it's probably unrealistic for both. Well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That Hamiltonian, so mm -hmm. it reminded me that that actually perhaps Hamiltonian. So just to clarify, that has nothing to do with the Hamiltonian torque. Right? Correct. Actually, so yeah, so the Hamiltonian, so, so the Hamiltonian here, and I'll say a little bit more about this in my next lecture, the Hamiltonian for this actually is zero. That's one of the quirks of this Hamiltonian. Either of those Hamiltonians, or at least of this part of the Hamiltonian, is zero. Then, so, and so that is true, what you just said. It has nothing to do with the Hamiltonian of the toric code. This is a low energy effective theory whose basic variables are related in a kind of complicated way to the spins in the toric code, whose role here is just to encapsulate the topological properties. So, so, so the line between this effective theory and this Hamiltonian is not very explicit. But the line between this effective theory and this, the structure that we're trying to reproduce with it is pretty direct. Because this, this one way to think of this effective theory is as a reverse engineering of this algebraic structure. Now, there is a more direct way of deriving this effective theory from, um, from the superconducting Hamiltonian, on the other hand. I'm not going to discuss it right now, but I'd be happy to discuss you know, offline. Yes. It looks like we had a lot of direct structure constants, and they are all encoded in the middle zero structure. That's right. And we also have some ambiguity. Like That's the right. Determination of, of our uh, EM size. That's and right. I can see that those ambiguities are they determined from here. Yeah, that's correct. So, so, so this structure. So, you, 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 what you said is exactly right. So, this structure, okay, in a given theory, what looks like here looks like a minimal set of data. In a given theory, it actually boils down to much less. Yes, sir. Correct. Yeah. Well. I, no, no, it doesn't fix the ambiguity in the R because the ambiguity in the R is related to things that are not measurable. So this, this, this theory allows me to get all the things that are measurable, which in, for instance, which would be R E M psi times R M E psi. So this thing is measurable and this theory gives it. It doesn't partic I mean, I think it's not particularly sensible within this theory to look at each of these independently. I mean, it does actually give you an answer for it, but I don't think that's something we should take too seriously. Yes. That's right. So, so the the yeah, good. So, and size just a combination of both. Exactly. 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 Yes.
Yep. So our EE1 is actually kind of simple because if you only have E-type particles, then there's no source of flux at the EC. No. Yes? You said they reproduce the topological property. Mm -hmm. Just to quantify that last one as well. Uh, you mean the last one is this, of these topological properties? Oh. Yeah, um, that theory has van also has vanishing correlation length, so this term's gone. No. <coughs> okay. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, it does. So I think that was basically the previous question. You need something that has you need something that has um, charge under both. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Then it's seeing two pi flux, which you don't see any. So it's just as good as having nothing there. That's exactly right. You can, you can just put in a source that has charge under both types of gauge fields, and then you'll see. I mean, it's, not, it's more or less the same calculation, but um, if you wish, you can skip the middle step. You didn't have to first know REM psi. You could have just done R psi psi 1 by introducing a source with both types of charge. I mean, th 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 these are... In this theory, these are just some delta function sources that you can add as you like. So you can put delta function under both kinds of charges. Okay. So I'd like to give you a second example to kind of round out the structure a little bit. So we've been talking about the Torah code. I'm going to give an, a second example. Okay, These are what are called, usually called Ising anions. Okay. There are three particle types. Okay. The particle types are, do are normally denoted by 1, sigma, and psi. And there's some fusion rules associated with them. So I'm just defining a, an example. I'm not deriving anything for you at the moment, although I will. So the fusion rules for these are 2 psi's fused to 1, 1 with anything leaves that unchanged. The non-trivial one, or the most non-trivial one, is that sigma and sigma fuse to 1 and psi. So this is the first example that I've shown you in which there's more than one n that's non-zero, um, and sigma psi equals sigma. No, by A, I meant anything. A can be either one. It, this is just saying that one times anything equals that same thing back. Yes. Oh, oh you're just stretching. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's always the case. Yeah. Yeah. If you, yeah, that's right. If you pop two sigmas out of the vacuum and you annihilate them again immediately before you do anything else, you have to get back to the vacuum. So this, and this, yeah, so this, uh, yeah, go ahead. Right now, this is just a set of fusion rules, okay, that we can define. We then have to see if there's a physical system that corresponds to all this, okay, which is what I'm about to do. Oh. Yeah. Something else before you annihilate it, then you can get something. What is, well, yeah, what it means is there's a two-dimensional vector space here. In principle, the, if I have 
two sigmas living inside of a bigger system that has other stuff in it, then there's at least a two-dimensional vector space associated with that, and the state of system can sit anywhere within, in principle, anywhere within that. Depending on what you do. Depending on what you do. Yeah. Um, Oh, actually. Now, yes, sigma is the antiparticle of sigma itself because one can appear on the right hand side over here. And that's the only way to get one on the right-hand side. Now, there's a nice physical interpretation for these fusion rules and also for the other properties, okay, which I'm not going to say very much about. I think Nick's going to discuss this and maybe also Charlie in their lectures. But I'm going to give you kind of a minimal piece of it that just lets us make sense of, of this. Which is, let's imagine, so we were just talking about superconductors. Let's imagine we have something like a superconductor, or vortices in a superconductor, such that each of these defects or vo superconducting vortices have a Majorana zero mode associated with them. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that there's an algebra of these operators they square to 1, and they anti-commute. So if I take gamma 1 times gamma 2, it's minus gamma 2 times gamma 1, but any of the gamma squares to 1. Okay? They're self-adjoint. That's right. Oh, sorry. And self-adjoint, yes. Okay. Now, what you can see for such operators is that I gamma 1 gamma 2 has eigenvalues plus or minus 1. So if I think of these, so call this one of my sigma, call these my sigma particles. Okay. Then what you can see is if I take, let me take these two sigma particles here. Okay. And I ask, what, what do they form when I put them together? Well, I need to know if I gamma 1 gamma 2 is plus or minus 1. There's two possible values for this. I gamma 1 is plus or minus 1. Those correspond to there's some arbitrariness. There's a gauge choice involved in deciding which of these corresponds to which of these. But once that choice is made, we think of the two possible values, eigenvalues of this, as the two possible basis states that appear on the right-hand side. So when you see an equation like this, this is really an equation about a vector space. These you should think of as basis states in a 2D vector space or 2D Hilbert space. Well, it, I wouldn't say it follows. I'm just saying this is, a, this is a way to interpret what happens on the right. So this is an example of a situation in which you take two of these objects together and you get a two-dimensional vector space out of it, corresponding to this case to the two eigenvalues, i gamma 1, gamma 2 equals plus or minus 1. That corresponds on here when I write an equation like this for these fusion rules. Okay, and These fusion rules, if I write this in terms of n's, it's n sigma sigma 1 equals 1, and n sigma sigma psi equals 1. So this fulfills the condition that Nick mentioned in his talk, which is that for fixed a and b, in this case both sigmas, there are more than one possible value of c for which it's non-zero. So we know from that that, or we should expect from that to get something non-abelian. What we also notice here is that because this operator can have, these operators can have two different eigenvalues, that this is the, 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 this is 
and I, this is a s scenario that you should keep kind of in the back of your mind as we discuss this, that these two eigenvalues correspond to the two basis states over here in this vector space. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. Let me just say one more thing, and then, and then, okay. Okay. So, um, so now if we take four of these. Here are four sigmas. Okay. You remember, if I take two sigmas, they can fuse to one. So two sigmas can fuse to one or to psi. The other two sigmas, so I can think of these two sigmas, can fuse to one or to psi. The other pair can also fuse to one or psi. Okay. So I can think of like the first two. And the second two can fuse to one or psi, second pair. And then the whole collection of four can fuse to one, because if the first pair fuses to one and the second pair fuses to one, that's a total of one. The first pair can fuse to psi and the second pair can fuse to psi, and that's a total of uh, one. Okay? So we, can, we actually have, for four sigmas, we have, or you can think of it as three sigmas with total charge sigma, or four sigmas with total charge zero. We have A can be either one or psi. So we have a two dimensional vector space here. Two dimensional. Okay. Now, I kind of made an arbitrary choice. I, I took one, two, three, four, and I said, okay. There's a two-dimensional space here, and the basis states in the space are when 1 and 2 fuse to 1, or 1 and 2 fuse to psi. Whatever 1 and 2 fuse to, 3 and 4 have to fuse to the same thing, so you get total charge that's um, trivial. But you, I could have just as well taken, instead of taking, asking how 1 and 2 fuse, I could instead have said, well, what if 1 and 4 fuse to 1? And then 2 and 3 fuse to, to uh, this should be a 3. OK. I could have just as well said, well, let me take this pair fusing to 1 and this also fusing to 1, or this fusing to psi and this also fusing to psi. It's the same two-dimensional vector space. It's just a different basis. Okay. So there's a basis change. that can be done here. It's normally denoted by F, the F matrix. So in this case, it's four sigmas here. And I'm now working in a basis where 1 and 4 fuse to B. And 2 and 3 fuse to B. So this is the basis change okay. Another way of saying this equivalently is that we're making four punctured spheres by gluing together three punctured spheres. okay It's the same vector space, but we actually have two different ways of doing that of gluing them together because you can glue along here or you can glue this way. And since it's the same vector space, there has to be an isomorphism between those two ways of doing it. And that is given precisely by this basis change. Okay. So here I've given you a particular case of the, what's called the F matrix, where all of these particle types are all sigmas on, this line, on these lines here. But in principle, if we look at some other theory, these are all different particle types, A, B, C, D. Okay. And then I guess it would be natural to call these E and F. So this algebraic structure includes at least one more thing.
which tells me when I fuse stuff, how to, how to change basis between different ways of fusing things together. Now, as a calculational tool, it's extremely convenient because if you want to braid, let's say, particles two and three, it's kind of cumbersome to do here because the R symbols tell us what to do when two particles fuse to a definite thing. And here, two and three don't fuse to a definite particle type. But you can do a basis change to get a linear combination of states in which two and three fuse to a definite particle type and apply the R matrix in that basis, okay? which is just a phase, after all, in that basis, and then transform back as you wish. There also are powerful consistency relations that this has to satisfy, that both the Fs have to, Rs and Fs have to satisfy, and I think that's probably where I'll pick up on Thursday. Right? Okay. So. Yes? So we can imagine theory for the same particles and R, but different Fs. Yes. You can imagine that, yeah. I mean, the thing is, there, there are consistency relations that I haven't explained yet. So that th these things aren't all arbitrary. But in principle, you could have a lot of these things being the same and something different, that some of these equations might have multiple solutions. Yeah. I think we should head out to lunch. Okay. We'll be back at 2. Two o'clock. <laughs> A little bit confused at the, toward the very end. Okay. Are you essentially saying that state with four Majoranas is two dimensional? Yes. Four Majoranas is a total charge equal to one. Okay. So what about two Majoranas? I thought that's two dimensional. Well, it's two dimensional because the total charge can be one or psi, but if you fix the total charge of two Majoranas, then it's also one dimensional. Uh, okay. So it's fixed total charge. Like total Fermion parity. Yeah. Total Fermion parity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So does it apply to uh, assume we have a uh, two particle condense and they all couple with uh, U1 gauge field? And once we condense double particles, we will uh, always have such kind of C2 logical order. If you had it's purely 2D gauge field, you mean? Uh, you talking about the case of, no, no. Like, imagine we have, uh, we're talking about ZT spin liquid. Okay. Like we have, first we have a, we start with a square lattice BBS, and the BBS vortex carries a spin off, and we have double, uh, double BBS vortex condense, condensation, where mm. the two spin lines can be gapped out. Okay. And then we get a Z2 spin liquid. Yeah, okay. Because we have a decompound spin on the Vison. Okay. And here the Vison, if we are in Q2, the Vison is really, uh, the, the Vison will fix the gap as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but for the real spin liquid, we are always in some quantitative materials. Okay. Then this, in this sense, the quantitative spin liquid always has some gap as no, not, necess not necessarily, because even in that, in that quasi two D context, it's possible for the two D the two D layers to decouple. You could have you could have a two D fully gapped two dimensional topological phase in a single layer, which is only weakly coupled to a different layer, so that in the low energy limit these effectively decouple, and at low energies, like at zero temperature, at low energies, it it won't have any gapless degrees of freedom. That really yeah. is, uh, because in that case, it's an emergent gauge field. There isn't a 3D gauge yeah. field. It's an emergent gauge field within 2D, well, and which, which purely lives in 2D. That's fully gapped. Then you can say, let's take several of these. Mm -hmm. And since those are fully gapped, if the coupling between layers is weak, it doesn't become gapless. It stays gapped. Before, uh, imagine that the Vison line will always goes out to, uh, to the 2D planes. Well, the thing is, the Visons in the different layers aren't necessarily strongly coupled with oh, each yes. other, right? Yeah. Yeah. So why, when there are multiple non-trivial fusion channels, the uh, anions are not available? Oh, so, good. So I uh -huh. know that the fusion uh -huh. space could be uh, multi-dimensional. Yeah. Because okay. So that's necessary. I, I realize it's not sufficient, but actually, it basically. So uh, I, w I want um, to say that, like, the abelian anions form a one-dimensional. Uh, right. Form a one-dimensional representation right, of right. the break group. Is yeah. It, does the uh, fact that you have multiple ends equal? G higher dimensional representation, exactly. 
Does, does it imply that? I, I, I find it hard to derive. Well, it tells you you have a larger dimension of Hilbert space, yes. right? And then, and then, and, th and then, in general, since it's, it's well, that that means it's multi. That, I mean, having a more than one dimensional Hilbert space means it's a multi-dimensional representation. The only thing you have to double check is that it's irreducible, right? Because in principle, it could be reducible. Okay. Okay. But basically, the reducibility is tell in those cases in which it's reducible. What you're really saying is that there's some additional local quantum number that's distinguishing the states. Okay. And so really, it's, it's basically a direct sum of one-dimensional Hilbert spaces. Okay. So the cases that occur here, which don't have any such quantum number, are truly higher dimensional. OK. So, uh, uh, sorry, I have another question. Yeah. So I was somewhat confused by the fusion space. Is it like mm -hmm. a abstraction, or is it really the ground state Hilbert space of our physical system? Because I would yeah. imagine that uh, it, it is the ground state Hilbert space that forms a representation of the Bergman rather than fusion space. Is it that correct? Well, no. The fusion space is the ground state. It's it's it, that it's that vector space. So if I if I think of the three punctured sphere. So this is the yeah. fusion space. Right? Yeah, yeah. So this is the vector space, the ground state vector space of the three punctured sphere. Uh, but but then there are quasi particles in, in your tunnel. Yeah, the quasi particles are just the boundary conditions of the punctures. There's oh, no extra quasi. This oh, is just ground I see, state. I see. That's why it's yeah. ground state. Yeah, oh, ground wow. state. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. So for the case of you know, two terms like this model, yeah. could you draw this this model, uh, picture, and then you combine the three two three-punctured yeah. uh, spheres. Yeah. Because I was worried that on the boundary previously you had mm. the dotted line with the E and E bar. Yeah. But here it could be either one. Yeah, you have, to sum, you have to sum over them. Yeah, so it's... it's um, you have to do a summation over C on these... You combine these vector spaces, you have to sum over the Cs. But what I was worried was... Oh. Like, you could, in principle, have in this diagram, you can have C and C bar, mm -hmm. and those could be one or psi in this particular case, but if it's a psi, it's not a continuum, but there's another puncture there. I actually didn't understand what you said. Say that again. Yeah. Yep. 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 And the C's you sum over, yep, yep. The thing is, like, C, C bar is 1 plus psi. In this particular example, C is, assume C is sigma here. 